So hi everyone and welcome back to the last session of the day. I hope you all feel inspired and motivated and there's a lot more useful information to come in this last panel discussion. So just before we begin, just a note that we're going to ask you to not immediately rush off at the end of this session if you can. You might have noticed that in your programs on the Attendify app, we've linked a feedback survey. Um, we really want you just to take five minutes to fill in that online survey and tell us how you found today. Um, and that'll be after this, uh, this final panel discussion. And I'm going to remind you at the end and put a link on the screen as well. So this final panel uh, discussion is a new one uh, for 2021, and we're going to be delighted to be running this panel discussion with our panel of trainees. They're going to talk about what it's like to train at their respective firms, kind of how they got there and their tips for you guys. So we'll take a couple of breaks for questions as well again. And the panel moderator is Olivia Partridge, who is the content producer at Law Careers Net. Liv, I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Liv from LCN. Um, it's so great to see you all in real life today. Um, and not actually have to worry about freezing in a really unflattering position. Um, so as Beth said, this is our trainee panel. So we're going to just be talking about um, life as a trainee at law firms, the application process, um, and we've got some advice as well for, for you guys. Um, so firstly, it would be great if our tra uh, trainees um, and panelists could introduce themselves. So if Matilda, we start with you. Um, so just a little bit about you um, and where you've come from. Hi everyone, my name is Vitola Kapala and I am a final year law student in Nottingham Law School. I'm on the LLB Sandwich course, so I spent my third year on placement. I worked at the Legal Advice Centre at Nottingham Law School as a legal assistant for a year. Uh, I'm now back at uni. I am a outreach project leader for uh, Nottingham Women's Centre project. So we every two weeks we go up to the Women's Centre and provide legal advice to the ladies that go there. Perfect. And Connor? Um, hi everyone, I'm Connor Fairburn. I'm a first year trainee at Gately Legal, uh, currently in my second seat in the banking team. Before that in real estate and I also did a bit of paralegaling in the corporate team. Um, Patricia? <coughs> I'm Patricia, I'm a trainee solicitor at Jones Day's London office. I started my training contract two months ago and we don't have a seat structure, it's non-rotational, so currently I'm doing quite a bit of finance and litigation work. And Annabelle? Hi everyone, I'm Annabelle and I'm currently in my second seat, which is in health litigation um, at Hill Dickinson and I am doing a health only training contract so I'm moving around various departments within the health business group so my first seat was in health advisory. Perfect and lastly Hannah. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Archer and I'm a third seat trainee at Pinsent Masons. I'm currently sitting in energy and infrastructure with a focus on construction and engineering. Brilliant, thank you everyone. Um, so Matilda, I think it'd be really good to start with you um, as a current aspiring lawyer um, searching for a training contract. Um, so what can uh, students be doing at uni to prepare themselves for a training contract? Yeah, I think my advice would be to try and get involved with as much as you can that will help you develop those transferable skills that will help you with being a trainee. So, for example, if you are if you have the option to do a placement year, I would highly encourage doing that because it gives you one year for uh, hands-on experience with real-life cases, gives you the experience of kind of having a feel of what it's like to work in the legal profession. Um, if you can't get a placement or you don't have the option to get a placement, try and get involved with any pro bono work that's there. So if your centre or mm. university has a legal advice centre, try and volunteer there. That's great to give you, again, that hands-on practical experience, help you develop the client interview skills, uh, anything to make you stand out when it comes to applications. For example, if you're interested in a particular area of law, you can volunteer in that. And then when it comes to interviews, you can then say, you know, I'm interested in commercial law. I have volunteered before. This is what I learned from it. I learned that I'm really interested in commercial law. I've tried other areas um, and this is what I learned from them. So I think it's really good to try and get involved in as much as you can. It doesn't necessarily all have to be legal. Uh, there's other things that you can do. You can volunteer as a student ambassador. Again, that's another way to kind of, uh, get some uh, transferable skills, communication. Uh, there's other organisations that you can volunteer with that are outside of universities, so support through court is another thing that you can do. Uh, citizen advice, if you can. Um, and maybe just your part-time job, because that's the, in that job as well, you collect a lot of transferable skills, so no experience is worth nothing. It's just about kind of uh, getting as much experience as you can to uh, work on your strengths and weaknesses. 
Perfect. Thank you. I think there's a lot of um, useful um, information there so that our delegates can implement. Um, Connor, just to come to you now, um, can you tell us a little bit about how trainees fit into a firm's business? Um, I think that's an interesting question because, you know, the reality of being a trainee is you're going to end up doing a lot of the kind of introductory work because it's cost effective. It makes sense for you to be doing that, those more straightforward tasks rather than, say, a partner who should be handling the more intense stuff. But a big thing is, you know, say you spend, if you're in seats, you spend six months there. And not only is that six months for you to learn, if you're doing seats, it's six months for them to try and make you into the best potential solicitor that you could be. So whilst in the day to day, you might be doing whatever tasks are required of you, you've got to take it all as an opportunity to learn. And the way in which the firm will look at you is as an asset, something that they're working on. And the way you fit into the business isn't necessarily, I don't think, going to be obvious when you're a trainee. It's all about what's going to be coming down the line. So you've kind of got to recognize that and I think take everything as a learning opportunity, development opportunity, and realize that they're trying to make you part of their business in an integral way when you're able to really apply yourself and everything you pick up on your training contract. Brilliant. Thank you, Connor. And Hannah, um, just like adding on to that, obviously every day um, as a lawyer trainee is different, um, but just generally, um, how would you say your day is structured as a trainee um, and what are, the, are some of the general tasks that you might be completing? Okay, so when we're, I'm thinking about planning my day and going forwards, um, you know, making my to-do list, um, as a third seat, and I do think it does progress as you go through the different stages of your training contract. So right now, largely, I'm very much dictated by, okay, what's the client work stream? What kind of tasks can I help out with? Um, and these can be related to project management. It can be related to documentation, drafting, and it can also be dictated um, by completions and more practical process-driven elements of a client matter. Um, and I'd say that takes up the bulk of my day. So I'd probably go from, if it's a project management style task, it could be you know, chasing contractors, chasing developments, the developers trying to get signatures. Um, but equally, I think there is a large focus as well on, you know, extracurricular initiatives. So whether or not that could be like driven by business development needs. So, okay, are you involved in a big client relationship? Are there any innovation, um, you know, strategies that you can help build, make the business more efficient? Um, right now I'm sitting um, on the client relationship team for Tesco. So quite a bit of my weekly agenda will be driven by, you know, catch ups with the client, meetings with the team, just to see um, how we can improve profitability, things like that. Um, and then also, you know, training needs. So updating my training diary or um, getting involved in uh, community and investment initiatives. So Right now, I'm also like a partner for um, a school, a local school. So we're doing a big Christmas hamper drive. So I'm trying to chase donations for that too. So it does just vary. And I think the key focus is definitely client involvement. And then everything else kind of flows from that. Brilliant. Thank you. And Patricia, who are the people that you work with day to day? And um, how are the teams structured and organized? Yeah, so at Jones Day, there is a department structure. So you have your finance department, litigation department, as with most other firms. In terms of specific matters, it, there will be a deal team. So by way of example, with the finance deal I'm working on at the minute, there's an associate, a senior associate staffed on that, and then a partner above her. And then I'm the trainee staffed on that. And day to day, I interact most often with the associate. And then weekly or every two weeks, we'll have a team meeting with me, the associate and the partner. Perfect. And um, for some aspiring lawyers, an important aspect to consider when looking for a firm is obviously the level of responsibility that they can expect to be offered. Um, and people talk about early responsibility quite a lot. Um, Hannah, what does this really mean and how is additional responsibility given to trainees? Um, so again, I think similarly with the kind of tasks that you'll be involved with, um, it progresses throughout your training contract. So I think 
initially when you're in your first seat and you're just finding your feet and feeling the rhythm of the team, you know, a lot of the responsibility that you will have is largely internal. So it might be internal project management, um, you know, helping compile documents from different departments, obviously depending on what seat you might be in. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is a lot of backseat, a lot of behind the scenes responsibility. So you'll still, again, have responsibility for compiling documents. You might be managing data rooms um, and just general document handling. And then I think ultimately this will then progress to more client focused responsibility. So you can have responsibility for like calling clients directly, you know, taking the lead on specific elements of a client meeting that the team might be running. Um, and then on the other hand, you might also be asked to take responsibility for firm initiatives, business development initiatives. So sticking your hand up for things like community investment committees or sticking your hand up to participate on a client relationship. These are all ways that you can be responsible for your own you know, responsibility level. So I think whilst certain elements you might be handed, on the other hand, you actually have to go out there and be proactive and chase that responsibility for yourself. And I think the co combination of the two is the way you're going to progress the most ultimately to get to the point of qualification, really. Perfect. And I guess an aspect of this early responsibility is getting involved in business development. Um, so, Annabelle, how involved are you with business development at the firm? Yeah, so I'm quite involved in that. Um, I think they give you a lot of responsibility with client from day one. So um, kind of similar to what Connor was saying, although you are as ju more junior colleagues, um, kind of the foundation of just doing those tasks. Also, you're the um, solicitors of the future. So it's really important for um, the firm to embed you with in those relationships. Um, because the likelihood is they'll be seeing a lot more of you um, as the years go on. And um, I've been on several um, clients' comments to NHS trusts. Um, and I think you have a lot of responsibility in terms of business development there because you're the, the main client contact and you're responsible for liaising between the client and the firm and looking for opportunities to broaden that relationship and broaden the work that we do into other areas. Um, as, as well as just build on the, the relationship that you already have by making sure that they're getting really good service and um, that we're meeting their needs. Um, so yeah, in my experience, that's been really valuable as well because it's, it's pushed me in terms of confidence and responsibility and, and autonomy there. And you're really giving, I think when you're given a lot of um, trust, you can really grow from that. So yeah. Um, Patricia, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, so I've been quite involved in business development as well, quite different to Annabelle in, in regards to at Jones State, it's been in terms of obtaining new clients or prospective clients. So for example, an associate would come to me and say, this, this prospective client, can you do some research into them? And then that research would go into a client pitch. So Jones State going to the client and saying, this is what you're looking for, this is what we can provide, and these are the synergies, and this is why you should essentially pick pitch Jones Day and that's been really interesting because provided the pitch is one I can potentially work on that case from pitch through to the end of the transaction so that's been an interesting element. Perfect and uh, Annabelle just coming back to you again what would you say has been the biggest opportunity you've been given since since joining the firm? So I think I've already given it away and that probably this is common um, just because I think it's great to actually see see things from the client side and you get a much uh, broader commercial awareness and that plus word and you're seeing actually what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and where you fit into that and um, so for me that's been really exciting and like I say it's just having that trust and that responsibility as well you know and um, that you're a really valued member of, of your team um, but I have also been to quite a few um, settlement meetings and um, court hearings as well, which I think is really valuable uh, to be able to be entrusted with, with going to those. So, yeah. Perfect. And just sticking with the responsibility aspect, I speak to a lot of uh, lawyers who were offered a uh, really good client contact during their training contract. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, Connor, about uh, client contact, what it really means um, and how often you are in direct contact with clients? 
Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think client contacts one of my like favorite parts of the job. <laughs> you know, when you're working on a matter, you might be told to just send an email, put a phone call in. The client doesn't think, oh, they're a trainee. They don't know. You are their contact. They will. You'll send an email. They'll just ring you five minutes later and ask about it. And it really kind of forces you to be good and know what you're doing. It's very much you know that you're there and you're handling it. And I think that's really exciting. I mean, client contact itself has, I think, changed over the pandemic. So, you know, once upon a time, you'd be handling, say, a signing meeting and you're looking after them and you're being, you know, this sort of friendly, calm face whilst you're absolutely trying to make everything work. Um, a lot now it's, you know, email and phone calls and setting them up and running them through processes and helping them in a remote fashion even. Um, so it's definitely changed, I think, as you know, pandemics happened. Um, but it's, I think it's an incredible thing to be able to do. Um, and it also kind of, you know, when you get to do it, you feel like you're being trusted because at the end of the day, the client is the reason you're doing everything you're doing. So getting given that opportunity for client contact is something that's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, it's a good reflection on you that you'll be doing it all in good time. Perfect. Thank you, Connor. And um, just off the back of that, I think it would be really good if we could chat a little bit more uh, specifically about firm life um, and your experiences. So Matilda, um, you're obviously a student at Nottingham Law School um, and on the lookout for a training contract. But in the meantime, you've been involved in quite a bit of extra work um, and various other opportunities. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing with the Legal Advice Centre? Um, and why would you say it's important for aspiring lawyers to get involved with, with work such, such as that? Yeah, so as I previously mentioned, I'm on the sandwich course, so I had the opportunity to do a one-year placement. So that was a really great opportunity for me to get an insight into what it's like to work in a law firm. So my duties included everything from admin work, so that is accepting the client's inquiries, so getting back to clients, uh, making arranging meetings, arranging appointments, uh, taking that client inquiry and then assessing whether we can assist or not. Because I think sometimes when clients send in an inquiry, it's just telling you a lot of information and you have to kind of learn the skill of how to look at those facts and figure out, do you actually have a legal issue that we can assist with? And knowing how to then get back to the client and tell them, okay, I understand this is a very troubling issue to you, but we can't assist at this time. Knowing how to explain why you can't assist at that time. Um, in terms of the areas I assisted with, I was involved in employment law, which involved uh, helping with drafting HR handbooks, uh, employment contracts, uh, assisting people with um, legal advice around un unfair dismissals, because at that time it was around the COVID time. So a lot of people had furlough, uh, this whole thing about the masks. So a lot of people were getting dismissed at work and they needed help with that. Um, I've done uh, welfare benefits, uh, so assisting client with a personal independence tribunal. So that involved uh, having a meeting with the client, uh, going through the uh, tribunal bundle, uh, figuring out if any information is missing on that, if we needed to look into more evidence to help them get an enhanced rate. And that was my first, uh, tr like, sort of representing a client task that I had to do. Uh, but I was very glad that the team was really supportive for me and uh, they helped me and we were successful in getting the client an enhanced rate. Uh, I also did intellectual property, uh, which involved uh, looking at trademarks, so helping with cease and desist letters, uh, drafting settlement agreements and coexistence agreements, which is all things that you wouldn't normally get on your law degree. So sometimes it's really good to know how to communicate with clients because I found I use this example a lot when I before I had to do any sort of like legal work I I was very confident with learning the law and knowing how to write coursework but it's very different when you have to communicate that to a client so uh, my first advice letter I think I approached it very much coursework style I was referencing uh, sections I was using very big legal words uh, I sent it over to the client the client emailed me back and said, thank you for your letter, but do you mind explaining what this means? So it's all the skills that you get from the experience that you, you, you get on work doing not just a placement, but any sort of like legal work experience. You get to learn how to communicate with clients, how to summarize things in a way that a client will understand how to deal with uh, different types of clients. One moment I'm dealing with a business client, the next moment I'm dealing with a, a vulnerable client, for example, who is struggling to understand what I'm saying. 
So uh, taking part in placements or work experience gives you that opportunity to kind of improve on those skills and learn those skills that will help you a lot when it comes to training contracts and even practicing. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, Annabelle, um, diversity and creating an inclusive environment and culture um, is obviously such an important aspect of all business. Um, while we can see that it's on firms' uh, genders, it's obviously become um, more, like more recently, um, they're t- starting to take it a little bit more seriously. Um, there are obviously many aspects that filter into this. Um, so I wondered whether you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the wider firm culture at Hill Dickinson um, and how trainees fit within that. Yeah, so in terms of wider firm culture, I guess you see it on like a micro level within your team um, because that's just uh, having people that are willing to get you involved in anything, just forgetting the fact that you're a trainee, um, come to this high profile meeting with me, entrusting you with a um, a task in a short time frame, those kind of things. Um, and I think just everybody being supportive when you raise your hand and you say, oh, actually, I'm a bit busy at the moment or I'm struggling with this. And, you know, can can you talk me through it or um, can I have somebody that I can go to about these kind of things? So really supportive in the, the teams that I've been in. And then in terms of the wider firm culture, um, there's a really strong emphasis on um, diversity and inclusion at Hill Dickinson. So then I know that that's filtered in as part of the recruitment process, but also we have networks um, that you can join where um, you can kind of be be celebrated for that and just all support each other or the other people in that network. Um, And I think there's a strong emphasis on well-being as well, which I think is kind of relevant. Um, It's recognising that you're a person, your life isn't all about work. And we've had some quite groundbreaking talks recently on um, things like menopause and also men's mental health. So we have these little lunch and learn 30 minute talks on topics like that, which um, just encourage you to take a break from your working day and actually learn about something that could really help you support your colleagues, as well as people in your life, people that you're you're in relationships with. And so I think it's really supportive um, and uh, there's a really strong emphasis on just making sure that everybody has equal opportunities and that we continue to learn about these things as well, because none of us are, are perfect in that respect. We can learn from each other, can't we? So, so yeah. Perfect, definitely. And I just want to give uh, the rest of our trainee lawyers, throwing you in at the deep end here, um, a chance to kind of provide some insight into your firm's wider culture. So if anyone wants to jump in, Connor, do you have any yeah, you want to yeah, add? Yeah, I can do. Um, on a similar level, you know, at Gately, we've got all sorts of networks that are dedicated to allowing people to be who they are at work and to take that away with them. Um, it's one of those things where you can often, I think, maybe view it a little bit cynically and it's a thing that, you know, they just do. But I know at Gately, it is so important. And the amount of people from all levels of the firm that get involved with it, it's a really important thing. And I think it should be, you know, and I think any law firm that's worth going to will do that, um, as I assume every single one here here would. Um, and otherwise, I think you'll, you'll find, you know, at, at any firm, but I know especially at Gately as well, People want to have fun. People want to work with people they like. What's the point of working really hard all week if you can't actually go and have a drink with them at the end of it because you don't actually like them? <laughs> you know, at least that's my priority. So to, you know, may, might, might be revealing some stuff there. Um, but yeah, it's. I think it is a very important thing to think about when you're looking at firms. Consider that wider culture. Hear what people say about it, and really kind of think. You know, just beyond the type of work, the type of training because it's going to be a big part of your life for at least two years and you want to make sure you can get the most out of it, be it in feeling supported or unable to do things or just being able to make the most of the time you'll be spending there. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Patricia, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I think it's been said. I think at Jones Day in particular, we do have a number of networks as well. And I think the firm is really keen to get trainees involved. So that's a big area where trainee involvement is, is big at Jones Day. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Hannah? Yeah, like everyone said, I mean, I think it speaks for itself that, you know, having these networks focus on diversity, inclusion, you know, extending, you know, opportunity to people who may not have previously been able to access the profession is something that's like super close to everyone's heart, I feel, at this point in time. Um, But on the wider point in the sense that, you know, ultimately, 
anybody can say anything on a website. And I think it's really great like to get involved today and you can talk to people on the ground, hear it from the horse's mouth and see what it means. You know, we're all candidates or we're all employees now at our respective firms. And whilst obviously we don't embody our firms through and through, but we are a good representation of who they put forward and who, you know, they, they do recruit. And um, ultimately, actually, I think, you know, every firm's going to say that they're the best and they're going to say that we're really friendly and really approachable. But I think finding the firm that's authentic to you and that you, you know, it's a two way process at the end of the day. Like it's not just about fitting in the firm, but the firm has to want you and you have to want the firm as well. So don't think that you have to fit a certain mold or a certain type that and say the answers that you think they're going to want to hear you say. And actually, you know, be your authentic self, be true to who you are. And I guess the rest will follow, hopefully. Perfect. Thank you. And that's something we hear a lot from recruiters as well, the importance of bringing your authentic self in your applications. Mm. Um, And so just moving on, um, given the circumstances of the past year um, and the lockdowns we've faced, um, working from home obviously became the new normal. Um, And obviously a lot of the training, uh, a lot of the learning that you do as a trainee is by osmosis. Um, so, Connor, how have you found completing uh, your training contract in a virtual environment? Um, I mean, it's been interesting. Um, and I feel quite fortunate because I worked there <laughs> before COVID. I've done an entire seat remotely and now I'm back in the office. So I feel like I've got a good kind of comparison. Um, hopefully, we're not going to have to go back into working from home. We're all back in the offices now, depending on how many days you need to be in your team requirements. It's all very flexible, which is a positive. Um I think in terms of working from home, we were very supported. The, you know, the IT shift and everything was absolutely fantastic. We, it was seamless. But I think getting back into the offices is the best way to be. And I don't know how these guys feel as well. It's a much better place to be. Um, hopefully, it's not something you'll have to consider when applying. How good is a firm work from home policy? Um, but, you know, I think it's, there's going to be a lot of good things brought from it. Um, going forward in terms of, like I say, flexibility around working from home. But, you know, almost overnight, people have gone from, well, we have to be in the office to work to, yeah, no, just, yeah, if you need to be at home today, second in delivery, yeah, fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it, is a, it is a stark shift. Um, and I think there's been a lot of positives from it, but it's, I think it's definitely good that we're going back the other way, um, especially as trainees and needing to learn and needing to be in the middle of it, you know, and pick, and pick things up in person. Yeah, there's definitely a balance, isn't there? Um, perfect. I Just before we go on to the advice um, and qualification process, I wonder if anybody, uh, any other delegates have any questions. Don't worry if you don't. Um, if you do, please pop your hand up um, and we can ask them now. <laughs> Is there going to be crickets? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah? Um, what one assumption did you have when you were going into the first day when you were when you were even signing up to these vacations that you now you had was wrong and why why you just thought that assumption was did anybody I, I think I have an answer to that I think my first day albeit virtually I thought everyone knew what they're doing <laughs> and quite often times actually I mean, I'm sure some people will say they know what they're doing when really they don't. But I think a lot of people, if they were being honest, half the time things come flying at you and it's just a case of, oh, God, like, what what am I doing today? But I think the feeling of being overwhelmed and on a treadmill, it's just getting faster and not slower. Um, It does get easier and you just find ways of managing that feeling of, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, but I can pull on this resource or I can ask this person that question. And, you know, you start to develop those strategies to kind of get you through that learning curve. And um, yeah, and I think just... I think everyone else might have had the similar experience of thinking, oh gosh, why was I chosen out of everybody else and a bit of imposter syndrome. But I think you do you do find ways to strategize it and get over it and you realize everyone else is feeling exactly the same. Thank you. And uh, does anyone else have anything they want to add to that? 
Uh, I guess I could say I felt the same when I was applying for my placement. I thought they expected me to know everything since I was successful, <laughs> but they didn't. They mm -hmm. knew I'm still a student and I don't know everything. So don't be scared to say something as well. If you're really stuck and you don't know what you're doing, just mention it to someone say, like, look, I haven't done this before. Do you mind assisting me with this? And uh, most of the time, they usually very open to helping you. Yeah. So don't struggle alone without saying anything. <laughs> Anyone else? You? I'd just echo those comments, really. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's just the fear of, um, you know, will I be put on the spot and I'm going to have to reveal that I don't actually have a clue, but <laughs> it's just everybody, so it's fine. Perfect. And does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, got one at the back. Is that about personality Sorry. Okay. What's your figure? Your biggest achievement from transition to a student to a trainee. Connor, do you want to start off with that one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, and this links back to what we've just said a little bit, you kind of go from finishing your degree, doing your exams, all that, and knowing what you're doing, and then all of a sudden you don't know where you're at again. And similarly, you know, you'll finish your seat and then you start your next seat. And again, you've gone from knowing stuff to knowing nothing. And I always get that kind of sense of achievement. And I always kind of try to put myself, give myself a bit of perspective on that basis of every time I get to that point where I think, oh, actually, no, I'm not an idiot. I'm actually learning stuff again. And I'm feeling like I'm in control again. And it happens quite a lot. And I think that is, I often feel like that is an actual major achievement because I'll sit there yeah. and I'll know what I need to do for the day and I'll just go, you know what, I'm just going to go do it. Yeah. And that is, you know, getting that moment where you kind of realise that actually your head's above water and you're swimming and you're fine. Yeah. You know, it's not a specific achievement in and of itself, but it's one of those things that every time it happens, you just feel like just such a, you know, you're proud of yourself for yeah. doing it. And Yeah. Brilliant, thank you, Connor. And probably time for one more question before we go on. Yeah, at the back. Um, I just wondered, has there been any tips or anything that you've been able to do that you feel like you've got an expectation Did you hear that? Yeah. Sorry, which seat exceeds uh, expectations? Yeah, are there any seats you've done that exceeded any of your expectations or like, weren't what you expected? I think for me, I... Coming into corporate law, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm selling my soul. I'm never going to help anybody ever again. <laughs> and coming into, say, energy and infrastructure, for example, okay, I might not be a Mark Clooney and saving the world and being a human <laughs> rights lawyer, but, you know, I'm helping in a small way, albeit, um, to build wind farms, work on HS2, you know, create sustainable communities try and make the world a bit of a better place in a roundabout way. And I think for me, that was the real surprising element that I didn't just have to get involved in community initiatives to do my bit. Like actually there is a way to make, you know, a positive impact within a corporate environment. And I think for me, that was the biggest kind of um, light bulb moment. Perfect, thank you. Um Maybe we'll have some time for more questions at the end, but I'm just going to move on to the um, uh, application and qualification advice. Um, so just thinking about the application process, there are obviously a host of things that students can be doing um, to support their future career prospects. Um, but one thing that we notice a lot of students kind of missing out on is their careers, the careers advice that they can get at their university. So Matilda, um, how would you say students can use their uni's career service to support them through the application cycle? Yeah, I think I would say make the most of that service because it is there to help you. I think a lot of the time students know it's there, but they don't attend or ask them for help. So if you need help with your CV, they're there to assist you with that. If you need help with the cover letter, they can help you that with that as well. Even up to your actual application, if you write it on a Word document, answer all the questions, take it to them and say, Look, I'm applying for this firm. This is what I've researched about them. This is my answer to these questions. What do you think? Have I tailored it enough? Or do I need to work in some areas? If they have like workshops that they do, attend those. Uh, at my university, they do a lot of CV workshops, uh, cover letter workshops. 
They even do some mock assessment centers. So it gives you an idea of what to expect at an assessment center. And you, by attending these events, you get to see again the areas that you need to work on. And then from there, you can then try and find these experiences that help you improve on those. For example, myself, when I did my first mock assessment center, I knew I needed to improve on my presentation skills. Uh, not that I thought I can't do it, but at that point I'd never tried to do it. So I made an effort to make sure I say yes to a lot of opportunities that need me to do a bit of public speaking. And the more you do it, the better you get it. I echo that. <laughs> um, for many practice areas, I um, obviously understand that studying content is going to be a little bit different to actually practicing it. Um, so Patricia, uh, do you keep an open mind throughout your training contract? Um, and what's your advice for aspiring lawyers in that respect? Yeah, I think it can vary from person to person. So I know a lot of the people I started with in September had previous paralegal experience in a particular practice area. So with the Jones Day training contract, they could just start on that day one of their training contract and essentially continue doing that into qualification. Whereas with me, I wasn't too sure when I started two months ago. I'm still not, um, which is fine because that's what the training contract is for whether it's the seat structure, but you're there to learn and you're there to figure out what you like. So I wouldn't, if, you, if you're going in with an open mind, that's probably a good route to go. Perfect. And during the training contract, taking on board feedback and applying it, it's obviously an important skill for everyone. Um, Connor, why, would you, why do you think assessment feedback is important throughout the training contract? Um, I mean, it, assessment feedback is kind of the point, you know, you're training and you need to, whilst you're doing those things, you need to know how well you're training. Um, I know, I don't know how it worked for the other guys, but we have kind of mid seat reviews, end of seat reviews. You'll have, you can set up as many reviews as you want with your supervisor in the middle. I know a lot of people do them weekly just to go back over what they've had. And it just helps you put everything you've done into perspective. It helps you deal with those feelings of imposter syndrome and thinking, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm making mistakes because it reinforces the idea that actually the point is you're making mistakes. The point is you are learning and getting assessment and feedback from your supervisors and from people that you've done little tasks with. All of that really does come back into what you're then going to do. The amount of times I've kind of, you know, realized I'm doing something and I go, oh, actually, I've had this before. This is not the first time I've done this. And I go back to what someone's told me. That's how you become within your training contract. When we were talking about you're becoming a solicitor, that is how you become a solicitor. So making sure you get good assessment and feedback and responses and everything like that, that is what's going to make you better. Otherwise, you're not going to have those touchstones and points of reference from the people that know what it is you need to be doing. Um, so it's, you know, I, I think it's the most important thing you can be getting really you know, day in, day out, week to week, month to month, it's, it's, it is critical. Brilliant. And Annabelle, just drawing off um, what Connor said, how, how else would you say that you can apply that feedback to your work? Yes, yeah, so I think as Connor said, the, the main part is the same that you would do as a student. It's quite literally looking at your past feedback when you next come to do that task. Um, <laughs> and just applying that really that's um quite straightforward and then i think it's as well just identifying if you you know received some feedback from your supervisor um okay well how am i going to do this better next time do i need to um speak to certain people before i start this task would that help more or um should i do a bit more research um, and just trying to push yourself as well to, just to build on that feedback um, and i think where you have kind of objective set similar to Connor, we have mid-seat reviews, that, those kind of things. It's just reaching out to other people as well um, in your teams and just seeing if they can get you involved in things. So I think it's just thinking beyond the words that might be written down or, or said to you um, and just trying to challenge and push yourself to, to get the most out of that, um, that piece of work and that seat overall as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And I've just had the five minute signal. So um, I'm going to come to each of you. Um, is there, um, Patricia, starting with you, um, is there anything that you wish you'd known about being a trainee before you started that you now know? Um, I wish I'd known more about sort of moving from university into working nine to five and needing to be switched on during those hours. I feel like at university, 
I would go to a lecture or a tutorial and then have some hours off and start my afternoon work. Whereas in the nine to five, you have to be on for all of those hours. So a bit of hindsight into that would have probably been quite helpful. Love it. Thank you. And Annabelle? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I think my answer would be what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, don't put too much pressure on yourself to know, to know everything. Um, but also just um, if I at the seats that I've in, done so far, I've really, really enjoyed and exceeded my expectations. And um, I did, have no idea at uni that you could do a health only training contract that you could do in quest or court protection. I didn't really know that existed. So I think I would have felt better if I'd known about the, the breadth of areas and just actually that don't worry, you will find something out there that's your thing and that you just click with. Perfect. Thank you. And Connor? Um, I, I think for me, I always just kind of think of it as perspective, you know, and going back to what we said about when you worry about things and mistakes and imposter syndrome. I know I felt at that point incredibly low about where I've been and what I've been doing and being able to have perspective and say, listen, I'm three months into a six month seat. Obviously, I don't know what's happening, but I'm doing quite well for three months in and being able to kind of reassure yourself that objectively you are where you're supposed to be and everything's going as it should be. And that doesn't mean perfectly, but it's that trajectory that you're on. Um, and that's a difficult thing to pick up and learn until you're in those positions where you do get things wrong. It does have a consequence and, you know, you, you're accountable. Um, so that's something that I think, you know, if I'd have already had that mindset going in and not expecting to get in there and start doing brilliantly, if I knew that that would be the process, I'd have found that much easier. And I think being prepared to kind of view yourself in your development objectively and maintain that perspective of where you are and your relative successes, I think that's, um, that's an important thing to try and try and get now ahead of time. And Hannah, is there anything that's not been said? Um, I think everyone's made some really good points there. Um, I'd probably say um, there's two, two things. Firstly, my definition of making a mistake now mentally is I'm learning. So you are constantly being told something's not right. And that's not personal and it's not a reflection on your competence it's just you are in that process of learning and making mistakes and having the freedom to make those mistakes and learn from them like that is the process and then I think secondly just having that you know confidence to be really self-sufficient and autonomous for your own development so if you feel like you know you're not sitting on enough meetings or if you feel like you know you're not getting that one-to-one -one contact especially with work from home like it's just so important at the moment um and just being self-reliant to be able to pick up the phone and say you know please can we have this chat i'm putting this time in your diary i really want to learn more about you know this particular matter or, you know, sticking your hand up for the opportunities, because whilst there's so many opportunities out there for you to take on, and I'm sure you've all, you know, found this one specifically yourself and no one's handed it you on a plate. So I think in your training contract, definitely taking that forwards and just like being as proactive as you can be, um, that would be my advice. Perfect. And I Matilda, mean, do you have any closing advice as well? Um, I guess the closing one would be don't be too hard on yourself uh, and don't get trapped in a lot of like comparison culture. Um, I know it's, we, it's frequent we ask each other, what experience have you done? But sometimes it's good to just focus on yourself, try and figure out the areas that you need to work on. We're not all on the same journey. Mm -hmm. People have different experiences. Just focus on yourself and being the best version of yourself. And that, I think that will carry you on. It doesn't matter what experience you've done, but if you make sure the little that you have shows the best of you that will help you. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. I don't think we have time for any more questions, um, but I hope you've all enjoyed the panel um, and your time today. I'm going to hand back over to Beth.